We're in the book of Nehemiah. If you want to begin turning there, finding that in the Old Testament. Last week we started uh, the study of Nehemiah, and you remember that Nehemiah was there uh, in Susa, the, uh, the capital city of the Persians. He'd been taken by uh, the Babylonians into captivity, or his ancestors had. He was born in captivity, and he's now in Susa serving uh, because Persia has conquered Babylonia. You remember that the report came to him about what was happening back in Jerusalem. He asked about the welfare of those who had returned. Uh, we saw that he was broken. Uh, scripture says that he wept and mourned and fasted and prayed uh, for many days. Charles Swindoll said it this way, he said, Nehemiah was called to build the wall, but first he had to weep over the ruins. And that's certainly true today as well. We have to see the ruins, we have to see the rubble, we have to be burdened, we have to even feel some pressure before we react and respond in a godly way. We have to take a look at the devastation around us uh, in our culture. You know, I've been wrestling with this all week, but this morning I've, uh, I want to set the message aside for a few minutes and, and just talk about rubble. Because before you can rebuild walls, obviously you have to clear the rubble. And I mentioned last week uh, when we were talking about the judgment of Israel, I, I mentioned judgment. And when you think about national judgment of our nations, there are many, of our nation, there are many things that God could judge us for. But I have to believe at the top of the list is the abortion of about 65 million babies. God judges nations who commit genocide. And you can tell if you've read through Scripture at all but cer that certainly very near and very dear to the heart of God are children. I also recognize that some here probably think that I talk about this issue too much. So let me, let me say a couple of things. One is I understand the importance of keeping the main thing the main thing. I understand what our priority is here as a church, as a body of Christ, but while we can't involve ourselves in every social issue of the day, there are some issues that are biblical and spiritual, and there are some issues that God would call us to the front lines to fight. You, you can't present the gospel while ignoring the brokenness. So this morning, we were going to show you a, a two-minute clip to promote 40 Days for Life. If you're not familiar with 40 Days for Life, there are 40 days in the spring and 40 days in the, in the fall that uh, churches and organizations all across the U.S. set aside to go to uh, abortion clinics wherever they live, wherever they serve, and pray that God would spare babies. Uh, our 40 Days campaign starts uh, in the next couple of weeks. It goes for 40 days. We as a church, and I want to thank, publicly thank Tony Blackwell, who leads out in a lot of this. We as a church sign up to fill two days from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., 12 hours, two days. And sometimes it's difficult to get those slots filled. So we were going to show you a word from a lady in our church just to kind of promote that. But when I, when I saw the raw footage... Um, I had to call up to the guys in the TV studio and say, don't edit that. Don't edit that down to two minutes because we need to hear the entire testimony that you're about to hear this morning. And we need to think about the brokenness and the rubble in our society regarding this one issue. So I want you to watch this with me. My name is Nancy Manili and I'm a member of this church. I want to share a secret with you that not very many people know. When I was 19, I had an abortion. My first husband and I were engaged. We were in love. And I got pregnant, uh, unplanned pregnant, at a time when it would have been difficult to raise a baby, or at least that's what we thought. We believe the lie that society teaches about or taught about those little cells, that little embryo 
that tiny little fetus not really being alive yet, not really being a human being. And unfortunately at the time, we made a decision that is permanent. I rode the train to New York City from where I lived and allowed um, the people that ran the clinic to do a surgical abortion on me and kill my baby. At the time, I didn't feel real guilty or feel a lot of regret. But we went ahead the next year and got married and I had two healthy daughters in the 70s. Um, maybe when they were three and five, I started feeling very regretful about my decision and guilty because I saw how beautiful my children were and how much I loved them and how much I would have loved a third child, how much I missed that baby. And uh, I was sorry that I made that decision. I, I was a Christian. I prayed and I asked God to forgive me. And I believe that he did. Um, later in my life, I became a labor and delivery nurse. And I felt very drawn for all the years of my career to the women who didn't get to take their babies home because they had a miscarriage or stillborn. And I facilitated a support group. I participated in every event, every, everything you could do in that job to help those moms who had to say goodbye to their babies. Uh, I still feel drawn to those moms and to women like me that don't get to see their child that they chose to kill. Um, I wanted to share this story with you because I feel strongly about the 40 days to life, the activity that our church participates in, and I did last year when I was feeling drawn to go and pray at the abortion clinic in Little Rock. Um, I felt like if only those girls knew before they made the decision how it would perhaps shatter their whole life. They might never have another child or they might have 10 more kids, but they're not gonna have that baby that they chose to get rid of because it was inconvenient or they didn't have enough money to raise the baby or they were gonna be embarrassed to tell their grandparents that they were pregnant. They can choose life. Since the 40 Days for Life started in 2007, over 15,000 babies have been saved by the prayer and the actions of the prayer partners that are there on the property all over the country, not just in Little Rock. I feel like as Christians that it is our obligation to not only pray at home and pray in church and pray wherever we are for the, the unborn. I feel like we need to go there. We need to be a public presence. We need to quietly and gracefully have a time of prayer, not necessarily protest as much as Christian prayer for the decisions that are being made, for the people that make them. I pray quite often for the nurses that work there, that they will have a conscience, that they will understand how they are participating in the murder of those little babies. As a bystander, how can they stand there every day and do their job? 
And I know that some of them do quit that job and some of them do change their minds about working there. I'm asking you to please sign up as fellow Christians. Sign up to go and pray one hour at the 40 Days for Life in Little Rock. Psalm 139, 13 says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know my daughter and I will be reunited in heaven one day. And I feel forgiven by God. I feel forgiven, perhaps by her, but I won't know until I see her and hug her and ask her to forgive me. Please help other mothers not make the same decision that I did. Nancy's not here this morning simply because she's on vacation. She would not be ashamed to be here, and i got to say I'm very proud of her for having the courage to share that story. <clears throat> I think you can understand, as I was studying the book of Nehemiah and thinking about brokenness, uh, when that video came across my desk, it just clicked that that's an area that we have to address. See, abortion is not just uh, a brokenness that's in our culture. It's a brokenness that's in every church, including ours, because there are many within the church that have been impacted, men and women, by the sin of abortion. Now, let me be very clear. When I say that abortion is sin, all of us are sinners. Lying is sin. Cheating is sin. Murder is sin. Hate is sin. Envy is sin. Adultery is sin. Lust is sin. I, I could go on and on and on. Yes, some sins have more or greater consequences than others. The liar's just as guilty before God as a murderer, but some sins have greater consequences. And if you're here this morning and abortion's been part of your past, I'm certainly not here and this church is not here to condemn you. We're here to help you. We have to speak about sin because we have to warn people. But we also have to help people find forgiveness and restoration. I, I want Geyer Springs to be the kind of place that broken and sinful people are drawn to because they know it's filled with grace-filled and loving people. I want it to be known as a place that is helpful for those who are struggling, a place that genuinely cares for people and that that is demonstrated by the fact that we're going to speak to sin and its dangers, but we're also gonna help sinners find forgiveness. I've got two objectives this morning. The first would be to say to every member of this church that we are all responsible. This is a national sin. You, you can't say, well, I've never been a part of that. I, I've not had anything to do with that. You, you can't say that. It's a national sin. When we get to Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1, whether it's today or, or next week, you're going to see that he identified with the sin of the people, even though he wasn't even alive at the time that they committed the sin that caused them to be carried into exile. He still owned it because he was part of that nation. But my second objective today is to speak as directly as possible to women and men here who have participated in abortion, and that is simply to offer you love and grace and help. Now, let me address one thing that I don't know that anyone here would think, but certainly the radical feminists would say, well, you're a man, you have no business speaking into this issue. I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd. It's my business to guide, it's my business to protect, it's my business to lead to safety, it's my business to bind up wounds. As long as I'm going off the reservation this morning, let's really go off the reservation. You guys in the venue, bear with us. John, I need these um, two stools, if you would. I think it would help to hear from more than just me this morning. 
I want you to hear <clears throat> from a couple of women. Uh, they've been forewarned, so I'm not putting them on the spot in any way, but I, I just, there's a couple of ladies I've had interaction with and talked to that I think it would benefit for you to hear from. And uh, Barb Nall, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to ask you if you'd begin to make your way up here. Barb has been in this church probably for as long as I have. I've known her for many, many years. Uh, her son, Corbin, uh, who grew up here, grew up in our student ministry. Um, Barb would tell you, uh, I'm not going to say anything she wouldn't say, Barb would tell you she's had a lot of difficulty in life. Some of that brought on by her own decisions, some of that brought on by living in a sinful world and things that uh, others have done. Is this too high? Can you sit on this? <laughs> no, you can't move back. You have to sit right there. <laughs> um, several years ago, thank you. Several years ago, uh, several years ago, Barb told me that she had had an abortion. And let me, let me just stop right there and say, what was my initial response when you told me that? No. You can talk to me, but you have to hold back. Okay. You know, my, I think your initial reaction was maybe a little bit of shock because uh, I've been in this church a long time. I've taught. Uh, but then your reaction was, you're forgiven. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I had my abortion, which was, has been like 37 years ago. And you were not a believer then, right? I wasn't. I was not a believer then, and I was directed by a, a physician, and um, I, I, I didn't know the board, and I also worked at an abortion clinic. I was the person that would sit or stand with the uh, patient, hold her hand as the doctor did the abortion. And so it's kind of like, um, you know, we get in the middle of sin so much that we don't realize we're there. Mm. And so having my abortion was pretty easy because I saw it every Saturday. Yeah. And that my abortion was about me. And most of the time it is. Uh, I can tell you I had a little bit of guilt, not a whole lot. I mean, it's, it was an every Saturday deal that I came and I helped. And so it was kind of like just a part of me. So what happened that brought change? Well, what happened is, um, you know, at that time, because it's been so many years ago, we didn't do ultrasounds in the clinics we actually trusted you. In the clinic that I worked at, did not do an abortion past eight weeks. So we would ask you, when was the last time you had your menstrual period? And we took you on that. Uh, on Wednesdays, you would come in and there would be two people that would visit with you because we never, this clinic never wanted to be felt like that we forced you into it. We talked about abortion. We talked about the fact that you, there are people that would adopt your baby. And there was people that you could keep that baby. Most people already had their mind made up. I mean, that's just the truth. You've already got your mind made up. They were thinking, you don't understand. I don't have a job. I'm not married. They had reasons. To some of you, you're gonna think, well, that's not a good reason. But when you're in that situation, it's the only way you see out. So on this Saturday, um, as I said, I always stayed at the head and, and visited from a very young lady to someone that was older. And I, I noticed that day, it was taking longer. I mean, normally this is, you know, I'm just gonna be honest, it's a five, 10 minute thing, you're out, it's over, and you go to the next one. Does that seem cruel? But it does, because that's what abortion is, it's cruel. 
So, um, it was just taking longer and I couldn't figure it out. And I looked down and my doctor had a, a, a look on his face I'd never seen before. So I scooted down to see what was going on and he was rolling in his fingers a leg with a foot attached to it. And it is because she had not, she was so desperate for this abortion that she had not told the truth. She was further along than she said she was. Um, I, I never went back after that Saturday. I still wasn't saved, but I couldn't go back because I had believed that if you, up until eight weeks, you know, there wasn't a, a leg there. There wasn't those things. Yeah, the sails. Yeah, it's just, it's just this gob. It's this little peanut. I mean, that's kind of what we're told. And so I, I never went back. Uh, I became saved about four years later. And I can tell you, not saved, I did not feel guilt. I mean, I just had an abortion. I mean, I'm not the only person that's ever had an abortion. I worked in an abortion clinic. When I became saved is when God started working with me and say, there's things in your life we need to talk about. And I became saved. And so for many, many years, I dealt with, with shame. I dealt with uh, the same thing that, you know, she talks about in the film, you know, where, what, what was that child? I was at a stage where we, I could not have told you what that child was. It doesn't make it any better, but it's what it was. And, you know, sometimes he really harps on it. And he will get an email from me. Well, actually, I text. I don't do good emails. I will text him and go, so am I not forgiven? <laughs> I mean, Dave, you just made it sound like I'm not forgiven. And he always assures me that I'm forgiven. And I know that when I feel unforgiven, that actually the enemy is saying, hey, your sin was too big. Okay, I want to take that thought right there because I feel like there's some folks here who need to hear it. You would either text me or you would say things like, are you preaching at me? Oh yeah, he looks at me. No, I don't. I no, no. I sit right there. He looks at me. I'm telling y'all. No, we... but you just hit the nail on the head. That's what the enemy does. And, yeah. and here's, what I, well, here's what I need folks to hear about, about all sin. Okay? Once you've confessed, you are forgiven. Right. What does Scripture say? First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. Thanks. Isaiah 118, come let us reason. Though your sins are scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Isaiah 43, 25, God says, I forgive your sin for my own sake. Why? Because he wants relationship. Psalm 103, 12, I separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. So, so why do we sit and feel guilt? We feel condemnation because it's the evil one. The spirit convicts us for the purpose of drawing us to the Lord, which is what he did for you. Satan condemns us to make us feel worthless, to make us feel like... God can't use us to make us feel like we're not important, to whatever. He condemns us to push us away. You know, one of the things I had to do once becoming saved is I had to, not to make it that I didn't do something wrong, but I had to say, you know, Moses killed because mm -hmm. of anger. Mm -hmm. David killed. Even though we can say David didn't do it, he had someone do it. And that's how I felt about my abortion. I didn't do it, but I had someone do it. Yet, God used them. And he used them in mighty ways. And I never doubt that God can use me. Uh, 
one of the things I want to do, you know, right now to some of the women that are in here, because I'm going to tell you, you don't know, none of you knew that about me. Uh, my children knew. I have a son, 28, that uh, I, I did not abort. Uh, the gentleman that I date, I've been dating about 10 years, did not know. It wasn't something I talked about. I do visit with females. Uh, there's two web things. Uh, I visit with women and we talk about having an abortion and not having an abortion. But one of the things that happens that I need you to understand, abortion is not just about an abortion. As a church, we have got to be able to do something tangible for those ladies. We can't just look at these ladies and say, Jesus loves you and Jesus loves your baby and then walk away. I can tell you many ladies that laid on that table had been talked out of it the week before, but no one gave them a card no one said, can I have your phone number? You, you just disappeared like so many people had already disappeared on them. And so if we don't, you know, it's great to talk and tell them, but I'm just telling you, unless as a church we're going to do something tangible to help them, we're going to lose them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being willing. I know just having the courage to come up in front of people is huge, well, but for sharing your story with you know us. I'm not through talking. Oh, no, of course you're not through. <laughs> He'll send me a text after church. <laughs> I have something I want to read to you guys because these are, this is something I keep in my Bible. It's something that's hanging on my wall at, at work. And I know there's ladies out here that's had an abortion, and you've never told anyone. And some of you are going to say, well, I'm okay with it. But there's some of you that are not okay. So there's two things I want to tell you. And this is what I, is what I keep. As you can see, it's real wrinkled up. One darkness in a person's life cannot undo what Christ did on the cross. I can have five abortions, and I will not undo what Christ did on that cross for all of us. The second one, which I struggled with a lot, as I said, is just because you do not feel forgiven doesn't make you not forgiven. You've got to remember that forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a fact. So I'm just really praying that anyone that is sitting here, whether you had an abortion like me almost 40 years ago or you had it last week, that you will contact me. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about how that, that forgiveness is, is possible. Because if you don't, you will go to your grave with that. And then I'm going to ask you to pray for the ladies that are here that are afraid. Because we, we judge them, guys. We judge people that's had an abortion. And because we talk about it so much. And they need to know they're not judged. They're loved. And if we can do anything, we need to figure out what we can do for those ladies. Now I'll let you okay. do your thing. Thank you. <laughs> you go sit down. You might 
wonder will people at Geyer Springs judge you? First of all, we're not going to ask you to share your story. Okay? It's not going to happen. But if word got out, would people judge you? Well, Geyer Springs is an imperfect place. There may be some people who would, but they simply need to heed the admonition of Jesus that you better not judge or you're going to be judged with the same measure. I will tell you this. There are people at Geyer Springs, a lot of them, without even knowing your name, that are already praying for you. They're already praying for you. I want everyone here and in the venue as well to either pick up the bulletin or if, if you've dropped it on the way in, pick up an offering envelope. I'm going to give three numbers out. I want everyone in the room to write these numbers down because I don't want anyone to feel singled out. And you never know, you may need this number for someone else. Okay? I'm going to give you three phone numbers, three ladies, Barbara's one, uh, Nancy that you saw in the video is the other, Lori that you're about to meet in a, in a minute is the third. I'm going to give you their, their cell phone numbers. They gave me permission to give these numbers out and just encourage you, you don't have to come to the church for help. Okay? You don't have to say anything to anybody in the church. You don't have to talk to a pastor. These ladies can help you. I want everyone to write these numbers down. First number is Nancy. Nancy. 952-352-352. 9523141. That's Nancy's number. Second number is Barb. 765 6499. 765 6499. The third number is Lori. 944-7142. Lori, are you, where are you? Oh, there you are. Make your way on up here, would you? Lori, I've also known for uh, many years, had the privilege of having her sons in our student ministry. Um, Lori lost her husband just a few years ago. She was already a, a uh, helper of uh, people in a lot of different ways, but as she went through that time and began to think about what God had next for her, uh, looked at missions, looked at several things, Lori ended up, come on, have a seat. I'll let you hang on to that. Lori ended up working with an organization called uh, Deeper Still. Uh, their main focus is that they do retreats uh, for women who've had an abortion to help them process through. Some of those women, it has not been long, some of those women like Nancy, it may have been many, many, many years, and they never processed through and dealt with that. And Lori has started a uh, Deeper Still chapter here in Arkansas. So kind of take a minute and do better than I did and explain the purpose of Deeper Still. Oh, wow. Deeper Still is a grace. Um, so many know that they are forgiven but they don't feel healed. And so um, it is a time that's set apart for women and men. I just can't emphasize enough. There's a mother and a father for every child that's aborted. And it doesn't just affect the women, it affects the men. It's lost fatherhood. And um, so Deeper Steel, actually, like you say, is retreats, and it is a time to retreat away and to, to let a team of men and women, Christian men and women, to come around you. I love the, to help in the healing process, because healing is a journey. We're forgiven, we know that, but healing is a journey. And um, when you come to the retreat, it's not, um, we can't heal anybody else. Only Jesus can heal. And so we like set the banquet table and lots of prayer and lots of preparation goes into it. And we set the banquet table and we invite the honored guest and we invite Jesus and he comes and they meet him there. And what I was thinking about in the scriptures, like the story of Lazarus, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, 
Jesus did what only Jesus could do. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the grave. But he was still in his grave clothes. Nasty, smelly, dead stuff. And you know, God could have just poofed him out of that, but he didn't. He's, he, he commanded the people standing around and said, unbind him. And so we get to help participate in the healing process, and Christ commands us to. So. All right, and Deeper Still has just started a chapter in Arkansas. You've got a board that works with you. Um, you'll be doing retreats in Arkansas. We will talk about locations because those are kept private, mm -hmm. but be doing retreats in Arkansas. They don't cost anything for the participant. Is that Correct. right? Okay. Correct. So what would someone need to do? Just contact you directly? Is that the best way? Um, yes. Um, Deeper Still Ministry has been around for about um, 12 years. So there are retreats going on all over uh, the country mostly in the spring and the fall. And you can go to the national website, which is godeeperstill.org. Uh, Arkansas, we're going to have our first retreat this fall. And um, so you can contact me or uh, our email is godeeperstillarkansas at gmail.com. So yes, uh, you, you have my number and we'd love to to direct you to a retreat. If we're not able to take you this fall, then we can direct you to another retreat. And, and um, we serve a most powerful God. I cannot believe that this found me. I've served on four different retreats in other states, and I just see the power of God. Um, I've not had an abortion. And it's really weird. It's like, why would you call me? But he did. I don't understand that. And we've walked through that. <laughs> but um, they've witnessed, or I've just testimony about this dark place in their heart. And abortion is not those people out there. It's people in here. A lot of people, I believe. And until you get fully free, you can't fully serve. And you can't fully be a pure-hearted worshiper before God. And our God deserves pure-hearted worshipers. So. Well, and I think the most important thing you've said today is, yes, there's forgiveness. It's got to be healing. It's got to be release from the grave clothes. So thank you for letting God call you to that. And uh, excited as I get a chance to kind of be connected, excited to see what God does through these retreats. Uh, I'll never know if any of our women go to that. That's fine, but I hope some of them have the opportunity to experience that and be released and set free. Thank you. I do want to say thank you for the church has been very supportive of that. And uh, I do want to share that there have uh, been 14 women from Ar uh, Arkansas that have been to their retreat. And I mean, when Satan takes away the chokehold they have a voice like nobody else does. And they are just walking in so much freedom. It's not just I'm forgiven. They, there's just so much freedom. And God wants to give that. Well, and I guess it would be okay since she told her story. It's not a break of confidence to say that Nancy uh, has been through a deeper still retreat. So she could speak to you yeah. about what that did and how that helped. Yes. Yeah. So good. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate it. Well, we're not going to get to the message today. That's okay. Um, this is a lot more important. We did have a message today. I do want to mention one thing in case you were sitting here thinking, well, that, that doesn't apply to me. That doesn't help me. We'll look next week at Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1. But let me just mention, as I said a few moments ago, I want to be sure you caught this. Nehemiah was born in captivity. It was probably his great-grandfather. I don't know, great-grandfather, Dr. Deal? somewhere in that, in that line that uh, God judged that caused him to be carried off into captivity. So he hadn't even been born. He had nothing to do with the sins of the Israelites that caused God to judge their nation. But this is what he says in his prayer down in uh, verse 6 and 7. I 
confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws. We can't say, hey, this, this, doesn't, this abortion thing, that doesn't apply to me. I haven't had an abortion. I haven't encouraged anyone. I haven't. It's the sin of our nation. And God will judge the entire nation for the sin of the nation. So what, what you just heard today, please don't tune out and say, well, that doesn't affect me. If you're a citizen of the United States, it, it affects you. It's a national sin. And we've got to move to the forefront. And it starts with something as simple, powerful, but simple as prayer. That's why we participate in things like 40 Days for Life. You're not going to go down there to number four office park drive and, and have a fist fight or have a scream and yelling match. We're just asking you to go down there and pray. Just show up and pray. Very, very simple. You have opportunity today is, is we're dismissed in a few moments as you leave the worship center. And those of you in the venue, there's a uh, sign up. Where is Tony? Down here in the main lobby. Okay. For both days, there's a date in September 25th and October 13, 19, okay, to sign up. It's a very, very simple starting point, but please don't dismiss the issue. Don't say it doesn't matter because I'm, I'm not a part of that. We're all a part of it. It's a sin of our nation, 65 million infants. We're all part of that sin. Would you pray with me this morning? I don't even know what to begin to tell you. The Holy Spirit's going to have to speak to you about what you need to do in response to what you've heard this morning. I, I can't tell you that. But we do need to recognize that we have acted wickedly. We have disobeyed the commands and decrees and laws of our God in this issue. Some of you, it's as simple as God's calling you to pray. You've never even prayed about it. You've never considered it. You've, ne you've never thought about it. Some of you, it's that God is calling you more specifically to show up and pray during 40 Days for Life and other emphasis during the March for Life in January. God's calling you to be a little more proactive. Some of you, God's going to call to speak into someone's life to share the material blessings God has given you to help a young lady be able to keep her baby, be able to afford the things that she needs. It's, it's different for everybody. Some in the room today, you, you really got tense when you understood what we were going to talk about, and you need to hear me say again that I and this church are not going to judge you. We don't need to know. You don't need to come here for help. We're just encouraging you to get help. Yes, you're forgiven. If you've confessed and you've given that to the Lord and you've repented, yes, you're forgiven. But Lori brought it up great like Lazarus still in the grave clothes. You need to be released. And there are plenty of folks to help with that. Maybe today the Holy Spirit's just impressing on your heart just to be brave enough to call. To call one of those ladies and say, help me. Father, I ask that you would take the words shared this morning, the truth shared this morning, and that you would use it first of all, in the hearts and lives of those who need healing. But, Father, also that you would use it to help all of us recognize we can't say we're not responsible. Help us as the body of Christ know how you would call us to deal with the rubble and the brokenness in our society specifically in this area. 
Father, we want to be a body that is loving. We want to be a body that is grace-filled. We, we recognize we have to call sin, sin, but we also have to help people find forgiveness in the Lord Jesus. Father, would you do, Holy Spirit, the author of truth, would you do what only you can do in showing us what you're calling us to? We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.